I think that it's not fair to say you don't have rules anymore. Um, what, it, what is fair to say is that you have countries like China and Russia, but China particularly, which are pressing hard to change the rules of the world. They have not yet succeeded in changing those rules. We still have Pax Americana. We still have a, we still have a, a world order in which America is the guardian, uh, in which American guardianship is definitive. Um, now, uh, but America, you're quite right to say that America has, for the first time since the end of the Cold War, real competition in the form of China uh, for the numero, numero uno position in the world. But China is, a far, is far away from displacing the United States, both militarily and economically, um, as well, but, but as well as in offering the rest of the world um, an alternative, attractive ideology. Um, the United States isn't just a superpower because it's rich and strong. It's a, super, it's a superpower because almost everyone in almost every country in the world wants to come and live here. So they, they offer a vision of life and they often offer a vision of politics and democracy that the rest of the world sees as, as, as a paradigm. Uh, China does not offer that. And yet at the same time, you have now more and more countries, including American allies, who join BRICS. Yeah, I think, you know, countries are always looking for ways to get themselves into, um, into, into lights, into ne um, you know, to get themselves on, onto a bigger and better stage. Uh, but, you know, you have, um, let's look at BRICS for a minute. Um, you have Brazil, which, um, you know, is, is a complete a non-entity on, on, the, on the stage of international relations. Not even in South America is Brazil influential. You have Russia, which is not an example to anyone in the world. It's just violated by war the sovereignty of a neighboring country, which it denies, whose right to exist it denies. Um, and you have um, China, which um, denies its own citizens' freedom. It, it denies Muslims. So before we, we start talking about China's support for the Muslims in Gaza, let's think about China's lack of support, in fact, China's oppression of the, of the Muslims it has in its own territory in Xinjiang, or East Turkestan, as I prefer to call it. And then you have South Africa, which um, marched Israel off to the ICJ on accusations of genocide uh, a few days after you had a genocidal attack on Israel by the very people that South Africa says Israel is trying to wipe off the state of the face of the earth. Now, the one country I haven't mentioned yet in BRICS is India, the I in the middle of that terrible acronym. Um, now, India is India. India doesn't belong there, and I've always said that India needs to get out of BRICS. The faster it gets out of BRICS, the better. Maybe BRICS should include Indonesia to keep the acronym going. But India has no business being there, A, because it's if BRICS is a kind of counterforce to um, resist American power in the world, well, it doesn't suit India, because India and the United States have never had better relations than they do now. And India has never needed the United States more than it does now in order to counter China, which has designs on Indian territory and, in fact, has taken by force um, several thousand square kilometers of Indian territory. Um, so, so why, why are they there? Is, is it like a tradition with the underlying movement leader and all that? Why are they there? I don't think India takes BRICS terribly seriously. I think it's there because it's, it's, it's a grouping. Um, and they're there because... Uh, um, why turn down an invitation to join a group of other countries that is, uh, you know, India has until recently been somewhat ambivalent about American, you know, let's not, let's not forget and let's not pretend that India has always been an American ally. Um, the American, the, the, you know, the Indian relationship with America was always a troubled one, you know, until about 19, until about the mid 90s, when the Indian economy started to open up and liberalize. And um, India decided that it was going to be a full-blown capitalist country as opposed to a quasi or a full-blown socialist country. Um, and that's also about the time when the Soviet Union collapsed and the non-aligned movement got washed away in that kind of flood of change. And so India began to redefine itself. But at the same time, you know, you have in the Indian um, foreign policy establishment and in the, Indian in the Indian political establishment, a lot of people who still have... Uh, nostalgic memories of the Cold War and of anti-Americanism and of pro-Sovietism. And so for them, a group like the BRICS is, is a, a nice way of confirming that India is not in America's back pocket. So it's, it's, it provides them with an alibi for independence, however hokey or spurious it may be. But, you know, 
not only does India not belong there because it's now increasingly pro-American, um, India doesn't belong there if if the BRICS grouping is going to be anti-Israeli because India, I mean, one of the one of the most refreshing things in the last 20 years in the global on the global stage has been India's relationship with Israel, uh, India's alliance with Israel. I would go so far as to say. Um, a lot of the credit has been given to Mr. Modi, who's the current prime minister, but let's not forget that the warming of relations between India and Israel predates Mr. Modi by several prime ministers. And I think to Israel goes the satisfaction of having flipped a country that was a major... It's not like Israel's relations with Nauru or Honduras or Costa Rica, or one of those lovely countries. I mean, and I'm glad they support Israel. But getting support from Honduras isn't the same thing as getting support from India. And when you have a country of 1.3 billion people with India's massive economy and India's massive armed forces and India's increasing heft in the world and, increase, and India's increasing desire, which I think will be fulfilled one day, especially as it's now the world's most populous country, of being a permanent member of the Security Council. You know, if Israel can, you know, if Israel, um, if India becomes a permanent member of the Security Council, Israel will have an ally among the P6, which is what it will then become, or seven, because India... You know, India will, you know, it, it will have acquired a country that will be an ally, it's a country that's favorable to Israel. And I think um, what we see, uh, you know, we've seen India's attitude to Israel um, during the whole post-October 7 Gaza war, where, where previously there would have been unadulterated condemnations of Israel coming from New Delhi. You've had quite the opposite, you know, and so... I mean, the problem you have in India is that the Indian left is still hostile to Israel, and India has a very large Muslim population, about um, 13 or 12 or 13 percent of the population, which is a lot. 12 or 13 percent of 1.3 billion is a hell of a lot of people, and they and their leaders are parrot the the line that is commonplace in the Ummah, which is that Israel is oppressing Muslims and needs to be resisted. Uh, a line that is never uttered in regard to. China and the, and the Uyghurs, by the way, uh, or about pretty much any Muslim population that is slaughtered anywhere in the world, except the Palestinians. Can you walk me through, maybe about, we are talking about Libya, about India's interests in the Middle East, and uh, I think that Israelis became more aware of Indian role after Biden uh, introduced the idea of the land corridor, India and uh, the Gulf countries. Look, it's a, it's a del India has a delicate dance, okay? It has, it's, it's, it's energy dependent, so it, it, de it depends on imports for its energy. It gets its energy from Saudi Arabia, it gets it from the Gulf states. Um, it also gets it from Russia. Um, so it's not, in, India is not energy independent. India also has vast numbers of um, expatriate workers in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, in the Emirates, in the Gulf states, um, So who send home um, billions of dollars of remittances. Um, the India, Indian overseas labor sends home the largest chunk of remittances uh, of any country in the world. So, um, you know, India has to be careful in its warming of relations with Israel not to put in peril both its sources of energy and its sources of remittance. You know, it, it, it has to make sure that the countries in which its millions of workers work aren't suddenly hostile to these workers. But of course, uh, what is in India's favor is that these countries are themselves adopting a more pragmatic and practical attitude to Israel. So they don't see India's warming of relations with Israel to be as the sort of betrayal of Indo-Arab solidarity that they might have seen, seen it as, say, 20 years ago. So we're in a stage, we're in a, stage of, of great, a great deal of pragmatism with regard to Israel. Uh, some countries like India have embraced a relationship openly. Other countries like Saudi Arabia have embraced it in a slightly more um, surreptitious way. And then you have the, the countries in between of the Abraham Accords who've opened diplomatic relations with Israel. We have former, formal accords and are offering a kind of template to other Arab states and other Muslim states to... Uh, to really concretize, concretize relations with the only democracy in the Middle East.